three, two, one. One, two, three, four, five. And what's today's date? Oh, 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 what a good question. My watch is about to go down. 19th. That's right. It's the 19th. It's the same yeah. day as the year. Cool. And exactly what episode are we on? We are 500 and I have no idea. 520. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Well, 19 yeah. is one less than 20, so that's easy. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm there. Yeah. Uh, it's 19, not. It, it's not three hundred. It's not two hundred. <laughs> I think it was four weeks ago. You said one hundred twenty-seven something. Not even close. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I'm, I'm quite precise with words, mm -hmm. and I'm equally imprecise with numbers. I, numbers <laughs> frighten me. They, yes, they right. dance up and down and run away from me. <laughs> I know. We have three together. It's really hard. I understand. <laughs> I do. Mm -hmm. 520, 520 on the mm -hmm. 19th, 520. How many? Five, 520. 520, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, George, you ready? Deep breath. Okay, here we go. Three, mm -hmm. uh -huh. two, one. Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 520 on a hot Friday in July. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. It's damp here, but it is Friday the 19th of July, 2019. And who are you? It's the, <laughs> oh, do you have a name? <laughs> I'm so sorry. I was so preoccupied with the weather, I, I forgot who I was. <laughs> there we go. All, all filled in now. Welcome. Obviously, it's Friday, our brains are dead, and uh, you're going to have to enjoy that as our programming continues. Before we get any further, you have a responsibility as a diligent viewer of Anglican Unscripted, and that's to kind of promote the show on social media. Uh, I need you to go right now to our YouTube channel, and you're going to see a little, little like button. Please like it. If you don't like it, click the don't like button. I want to hear from you as well. Um, I also need people to click that little subscribe button. If you're not subscribed and getting instant updates of when the shows come out, you probably want to because amazingly, this summer has been a busy summer in news. If you see us on Facebook, click you like. And please, if you so desire to share us, share with your friends, your clergy, your laity. Let them know what's really going on in the Anglican Communion um, because that's what George, Gavin, and I do. Um, George, it's a thousand degrees up here in Connecticut. What are you doing down over there in Florida? Working very, very hard. As yes. you mentioned, Kevin, this has been a major news week mm. with a great deal of behind the scenes work going on. Plus the parish life continues. I've got a lot going on. We've just started a, an Anglican missile service on Saturday night, uh, replacing one of our contemporary services. Mm. So great deal of activity. Plus, the Anglican Communion is bursting and burst in flames and is burning down all around us simultaneously. Gavin, you were traveling this week, so we didn't record on Monday. What were you up to? Well, if you'll forgive me a moment's uh, unrestrained narcissism. No, oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the last time I went to Durham, I was on a short list to be interviewed for uh, Principal St. John's College hmm. a long time ago now. Um, what we didn't know was that Stephen Sykes, the Bishop of Ely, had it in the bag. It was patronage again. And um, all of us who were shortlisted were just cosmetic fodder. So this is the first time I've been back since. And who would have thought that uh, history would have turned in the way that it has done? But I went back to visit a very impressive church, an independent Anglican church called Christ Church Durham, run by a very impressive priest called Tony Jones. Uh, to, to, to talk to them about matters of common concern. So it was exciting to go back to Durham, a, a real surprise at the way the wheels of history have turned and, um, uh, and, and enormously encouraging to see what happens when a church built upon the gospel, good practice, intelligence and prayer <clears throat> gets, gets to flourish and bring people to Christ. The last time I went to Durham sounds like a Glenn Campbell song. It it does, yeah. I, I, I nearly reached for my guitar or my ukulele and found some notes to accompany it. <laughs> I, the monkeys have last train to Clarksville, but I don't know. Go on. Uh, let's transition into, into some news here. We're going to get to the Church of England. Yes, it's, oh, it's a mess. 
However, there's lots of news in the Anglican Communion as well. Uh, apparently, there's uh, chaos going on in Canada. And you, know, you think Canada, the maple leaf is their flower, their, their state flower, their flag, and everything else. How, how chaotic could it be up there? Well, we have a diocese that's leaving the province. George, what's the news there? Well, it's a lot of news. The Anglican Church of Canada held their general synod in Vancouver this week. And they elected a new primate, Linda Nichols, the Bishop of Huron. And they also had the second reading of their amendment to the marriage canon. And the amendment to the marriage canon would allow uh, same-sex marriage under the prayer book of the Church, Anglican Church of Canada. It fell short in the House of Bishops. They needed a two-thirds margin in each of the houses, clergy, bishops, and laity. And it fell short. Now, three liberal bishops were not able to attend this meeting because of illness, but even if they had come, it still would not have passed. And after the vote was taken, the, uh, the uh, church, the uh, individual bishops said that it would ignore this vote and that they would go ahead. Susan Bell, the Bishop of Niagara, which is that lower peninsula of Ontario that sort of butts up against uh, uh, Buffalo and Niagara Falls, said that we have different realities here in Niagara, uh, different truths, and what may be moral uh, here may not be moral in the Arctic. Hmm. And therefore, our truth is our truth, your truth is your truth, there is no single one truth. Well, we had a similar statements saying the bishops would not follow this, and the bishops released a statement saying, we are going to allow local option on this. And the reason why is because we've been given a legal opinion by the chancellor in 2016, and we're going to keep pressing this button, which is we're going to take an argument from silence. The marriage canon does not forbid same-sex marriage. And since it doesn't forbid it, therefore we say a warrant to allow it. Now, in the debates around this, the Bishop of the Arctic, uh, Donald Parsons, said, well, it says nothing about polygamy, therefore is polygamy now legal. Well, they, being Canadian, they didn't want to argue about this. But today, the bishops of the Arctic have announced that they have broken communion with the Anglican Church of Canada, that they are the Anglican Church of Canada in the Arctic. It's unclear whether they're quitting the Anglican Church of Canada completely. We are hearing differing views on this. One, bit, one of their four bishops says no, another says yes. So we'll see how this works out. But, but, no, Arctic is not joined Anic. No, it's not uh, hopped on a different train. It may just be going its own way. It may be an impaired communion, but the Canadian Church is unraveling. Well, they they don't get their money from internal activities. They have to get their money uh, from so who who kicked their camera? Was that you, Gavin? I did. No, it was That's me. Right. I was <laughs> if you were in California, that would have made more sense. With the yeah, that is, yes. They have the Council of the North, which funds yeah. the uh, funds ministries in uh, in the Yukon and in uh, the Arctic and the Northwest Territories, places like that. And so a lot of the money to support the Arctic Church does not originate in the Arctic. So there are those financial considerations that Kevin mentioned that may cause them to keep some sort of tie, but they will certainly not adopt the position taken by some of the l larger places to the south, Montreal and so forth. Let's transition a little uh, to England for a moment. Uh, we've complained that the Church of England does not support <clears throat> its Christians, or at least the Orthodox Christians, or the Christians who actually believe in Christ. Uh, if you want to have an opinion and your work fires you for that, you would expect the church to stick up for you. Um, there was a case where a gentleman was just protected by its Christian concern, right? Yes, yeah, we've but... the Christian concern have had have had two cases um, mm -hmm. that come to the forefront this this last week. One of them with very good news. Uh, there's a, a marvelous African social, Christian social worker called Felix Nagoli, mm -hmm. and Felix was thrown off a social work course because he was involved in some private chat on Facebook, on his private account, uh, and, he, uh, and, and essentially about what the Bible taught. So he wasn't even saying, I believe this, I believe that. He simply said, in terms of informing you about the issues, actually the Bible teaches this. One of his 
co-workers on his course denounced him to Sheffield University. They threw him off the course and said, you're too dangerous to be a social worker. Go back where you came from. Go back where you came from. Oh, my Lord. Fix fix things there. Uh, And so he he went to um, the Court of Appeal, I think. There were three judges. And they said that, uh, first of all, he hadn't said anything wrong. And then that the Sheffield University were, were, were mistaken to base their judgment on attitudes he might hold in the future, hypothetically, which is which is the the Orwellian extent to which the university were trying to uh, pass judgment on him. So now all they've said is the university were wrong to throw him off. He's yet to discover whether he's allowed back on or not. But it was a a small but very significant step. Um, against the progressive tide and he was on the radio radio bbc radio and uh, they they brought up a gay activist to in, to uh, uh, quiz him on his views and he he did really very well indeed but this is not a victory this is this is a temporary halt in the flood and at the same time there was a, a christian doctor called david mccarath uh, he was he, he'd been he had 30 years of experience 28 i think he was working he wanted to work for the government, for their Department of Pensions, and he was engaged in disability training. Um, nothing actually happened. He was offered a hypothetical question. If a large bearded man uh, appeared in front of him and demanded to be called she, what would he do? Uh, and David said, well, I have two problems. I'm a doctor and a Christian. Uh, and as a doctor and a Christian, I, I, I think the man's identity is defined by his biology. So. Uh, that's where I come from. So they sacked him on the spot. Um, the, the, the problem with this, of course, I mean, he quite rightly then said, do you really want doctors who are prepared to work against their consciences and prepared to tell both the state and patients what they want to hear as opposed to what is medically and biologically true? Now, the really important thing is that as part of the evidence that this Christian expert biologist was being unreasonable in depending on science and biology instead of cultural dogma and gender, the chief witness for the prosecution was the Archbishop of Canterbury. So the judges went to the Archbishop of Canterbury and said, well, he believes in transgenderism. Look at this enthusiastic foreword he's written in a a book that goes to all Church of England schools. Well, now, if we have to look for who's the real Christian here, the Archbishop or you, clearly the Archbishop must be and so, you know, your position is is weak. Whereupon a number of people said, well, actually, we don't really think the Archbishop of Canterbury is a good Christian or a good example of being a good Christian. Indeed, many people the world over would think he's sold out rather badly and has confused his categories. But joking aside, it was an appalling travesty that so far from being defended by Christian public Christianity in this country, uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury's views were used to undermine this Christian doctor's witness about the criteria on which he based his professional and Christian judgment. Well, here in America in 2016, uh, there was two researchers from John Hopkins University who put together a wonderful paper on uh, homosexuality and transgenderism and used science to say that there's just no science to support you're born that way. There's no gene, there's no... Uh, DNA proof anywhere and you know it was a a 12-year study they had the data they had the you know the statistics and they laid it out a hundred and forty three page report Um, and John Hopkins the uh, university and hospital initially supported it said yep it's it's a good report but the influence and outrage of gay society if you will and culture came against them so hard that these guys can't get a paper published anymore. And the, uh, I think it was the Atlantic or whoever published this paper for them, uh, put out a, uh, uh, what do you do when you pull an article out? Uh, uh, Yeah, a a couple months later said, it wasn't well researched. Gosh. And so it's not just religion. Um, Because anthropology, medicine, science, history, um, all the, the forms of muse do not support uh, transgenderism or homosexuality uh, it's not just a fight any longer against Christianity they have to fight science they have to fight medicine they have to fight anthropology they have to fight uh, history and 
um, I, I, I see if you don't start, if you're not going to defend the Christians, are you going to defend the scientist? Are you going to defend, you know, uh, anthropologist? I, I don't know. Let me take a slightly different path on this, Kev, uh, Kevin. Hmm. Um, I, frankly, if, if you want to call yourself what you want to call yourself, that's fine. You can call yourself that. The issue for me is the one I think that Jordan Peterson, the Canadian yeah. psychologist, has really said, is that when you compel me to adopt yeah. your worldview, that's, mm -hmm. a total, that's a totalitarianism. That's basically saying that there's a power greater than my own autonomy that determines what I may say and what I may think. If you want to, you live your life the way you choose to live your life. I may disagree with your lifestyle choices, but live and let live but when you start to compel me to support your thinking your worldview your politics your gender ideology that's the that for me is the the line that i believe cannot be crossed well, and what when compulsion is used by, by the state to compel uh lines of lines of thinking and speech and science and belief codes that's, well, that's abhorrent yeah, that brings me to think up of Aja Bibi. Aja Bibi was, uh, she was in Pakistan, right? Yes. That's her, Pakistan. Uh, she was being persecuted as a Christian for being a heretic and uh, for uh, all those things, and the Muslims wanted to kill her. Islam to forbid you to convert to Christianity, how dare you? And she went to trial, and finally the trial allowed her to sneak out of the country to Canada. Now, Canada will allow you to believe it, but they won't allow you to say it yet. You, you can believe all the Christian things that she believes, um, but she's not allowed to profess it. In uh, Pakistan, I'm sure what that noise is, in Pakistan, you can't believe or profess it. In America, you can, con you can currently believe and profess, but not for much longer. I think that's the persecution that's coming. You are allowed to believe what you want, but you can't say a damn word about it. I, well, yes, I think I, that tendency is coming the way, but Kevin, I just can't see it happening in the United States because the, the culture, the individualism, the uh, ability to say the, to the government or to anybody who tells you what to do to FO, I mean, it's just, uh, I, that's we live you in talk. a different world in Europe. <laughs> we're not, we're not, we're not Swedes. Uh, where we're conformists, we're not the Dutch. Where we just do what the, whoever the powers does. I, I, if, I up if, to a point, I but just don't see that I see people get fired all the time now through the social media onslaught of attack. When somebody does something uh, of moral ground that the uh, Twitter doesn't like, there is a massive attack. They call up the employer. The employer doesn't want to lose business, and through um, this influence of social media, they they can the person and we see that you know once a month but, now maybe twice a month but, but at the same time kevin look at all this latest furore over racism at this stage you could there is no such thing as racism anymore racism has been wiped so out over, yes <laughs> the charge that one is a racist mm -hmm. has been so overused in the united states that is a meaningless term now, if uh if nancy pelosi and Donald Trump and Alexander Ocasio Ortez are all racist simultaneously. Who is not a racist? My my cat Skyler is a racist. But but, but my yeah. but my uh, I guess my point saying is that uh, each culture has a different approach to these things. But I I I hope it does not go the way you're suggesting <clears throat> it will go. Okay. We have well, a very witty we have a very witty. Twitter uh, account in this country called in the name of a woke activist woman called Titania McGrath. Uh, uh, yeah. Titania McGrath is in fact a left-wing gay man who is extremely clever and one of the, but he's he's very concerned that the left may overstep themselves and so by means of this spoof uh, woke account uh, he makes fun of the far left and I listened to him dis discussing his, his work the other day and he said this is based on the fact that if he makes enough fun of the left, they'll stop. Oh. And, and, but, 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 you know, it's quite clear they won't stop. And um, uh, certainly here in England, uh, we're on the very, we, there, are, there, there are certainly many things you cannot say, and we're right on the edge of things you cannot think either. I've just written an article for the Jersey Evening Post in which uh, I, I quoted an American 
reputable American sociologist who produces excellent data saying that uh, the children of in traditional marriages with mother and father fare better than those in with gay parents um, and, and in one sense to some of our readers this will be a no-brainer no partly because the statistics are that lesbian relationships are far less enduring than any other and male gay relationships are far more promiscuous than any other and so children in both those environments suffer both the fragility of the lesbian relationship and the promiscuity of the male. Now, it's pretty obvious to anybody that that is likely to cause some difficulty to, to growing children. And indeed, you've got cases in America in the last couple of years where children who've been farmed, who've been commodified for gay relationships have been complaining that their rights have been offended and their experiences have been dreadful. But when I put this in a newspaper article, uh, the public erupted and the editor was on the phone straight away and said, well, you're going to have to apologize for quoting for, for quoting this science because apparently the science saying the other thing. And we were back to the doctor, the Christian doctor. Um, what, you know, what are the facts as opposed to what's the social dogma? Mm -hmm. But the problem at the moment is even if you rely on facts, social dogma will triumph and we're in real trouble. And there's a lot of money behind social dogma. Here in our presidential campaign coming up in 2020, there's a Democratic field of 20,000 people running for president. Um, the, gay, the, the gay candidate is raising the most money because there's so much money out there to give a person who's gay and get that type of message into office. They would love to do that. One of the things I think is a, is a great misapprehension, and I think... Uh, people look at the rise of uh, of Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. Do not disturb it. They say wasn't that me. Uh, wasn't me. <laughs> well, let me let me just put it this way: Do, uh, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez's congressional district in New York has three hundred and forty-seven thousand odd registered voters. Only eight percent of those went to the polls. This woman was elected to Congress with only 14,000 votes out of 347,000 registered voters. It's because in that congressional district, like the district where uh, the congresswoman from Detroit, uh, who's equally notorious, the, those districts, they just, the cultures there are not voting. And so for people to all of a sudden assume that there's a groundswell for this liberal activism, you really have to count the numbers. And the numbers aren't there for this hard left revolution that people are bemoaning is taking place. The real numbers are for the center, which is what we're seeing the wiser members of the democratic leadership doing, saying, look, these people only speak for themselves. We're not gonna be pulled over the cliff with them. If you watch media in America, CNN, Fox News, NBC, CNBC, MSNBC, they all are all in saying, you know, the left has its voice now and uh, you need to be afraid. And George is right. The numbers really aren't there. And, and, and the thing is you cannot trust, uh, here we are, the media saying you yes. cannot trust the media. I was a professional. One of the, my past jobs was I wrote professional media criticism uh, for uh, one of the for a website called Get Religion, uh, which crit critiqued religious journalism in the secular press. And one of the things that we kept hitting again and again and again, I finally stopped because it got dull, was that you cannot trust the New York Times, the BBC, the Guardian, uh, to have an understanding of religion to report on it wisely. Now, there's one level of ignorance where uh, Justice Scalia once said in a meeting that I wish to be a fool for Christ, and the New York Times said, this man is uh, proclaiming that he's an idiot, not sort of picking up the fact that that's like a quotation from St. Paul. They didn't know, understand that. To not understanding, uh, you know, doctrine and discipline and dogma and the fight's going. You cannot trust the media. You've got to think for yourself. Amen. Yeah, and don't, you know, necessarily, we, we would appreciate your trust, of course, but you can fact check us all day long if you want, and we, we have no trouble with that. That's what the comment section on YouTube is for. <laughs> we need to transition or we're going to run out of time. Back to English perverts. Go ahead. No, no, no. I thought we'd do the Hong Kong <laughs> thing first. Okay. Because <laughs> we want to slowly transition to in English perverts, and this is the best buffer story for that, George. What's going on in Hong Kong? Well, we've been reporting upon all the fun in Hong Kong. There have been pro-democracy uh, protests, 
with millions of people taking the street to protest the pro-Peking legislature kowtowing to the government in Peking. And one of the silent or actually unfriendly voices has been the Archbishop, Anglican Archbishop Paul Kwong. Uh, Kwong has voiced support for the government. He has told the activists to stay at home, not break the law. He has been in the pocket of the communist government from the very beginning. And we contrast his behavior to the Catholic hierarchy in Hong Kong, which has been in the streets with the people. And one of the questions that I like to ask myself is why? Who benefits? Why is Paul Kwong taking such an extraordinarily politically, socially, culturally unpopular stance for his? And I think I may have the answer. The Hong Kong legislature's planning development board just granted an extraordinary waiver to the Diocese of Hong Kong to develop its colonial era properties in the center of Hong Kong Island. There are height restrictions and there are four listed properties that normally you could not touch. And now the Hong Kong government has said to the Diocese of Hong Kong, you may knock these down and build 40, uh, 24 to 40 story buildings pocketing tens of millions of dollars in profits. Mm. And gosh, this has just happened out of the blue. I wonder if there was a quid pro quo here that, you know, you play nice and and back the government line and the government will play nice with you and allow you to tear down your heritage properties and build skyscrapers. What Hong Kong needs is more boxes in the sky. Uh, sounds like blackmail. I, do I know this for a fact? Have I seen the canceled checks? No, I haven't. No, no, it's, but, you it's, know, it just it stinks. Yeah, it's conjecture, and we do that in, in the in the news media. All right, let's transition. I want to plug my ears. Up. What's that? Yeah, let's transition to England. Gavin, what on earth is going on over there? Uh, so people <clears throat> understand this is the last story we're doing today because we don't want to talk about this stuff. Some people have uh, uh, accused us of, oh, we just love to talk about the bad news in England. No, no. On a Friday afternoon, I would like to take off early from work and go sit on the beach. I got better things to do than talk about uh, sexual pravity uh, within the church, within the leaders of the church, within the 70s and 80s culture of the church. This is getting sickening. Uh, George, Gab, and I have better <clears throat> things to do. And there's a lot we're not going to talk about. We've been fed news from victims and those in the know all week long, and it is atrocious. Um, Before we I think go I down this path, can I, Gavin, I, I, being presumptuous and offering you here, I think we need to recognize that there are some heroes out there. One there of them is a man named Adam Tennyson. Mm -hmm. It's not all black. There are people who are finally willing to stand and I hope you touch upon uh, innocence testimony and take it away, Gavin. I'm sorry. Thank Do you, you, George. I was I was about to start there, and uh, if I had any doubts that I should have done, you've set them at rest. So thank you for the encouragement. It takes us to the ICSA hearings, the Independent Child Inquiry hearings, and the two big interviews recently have been the Archbishop of York and the Archbishop of Canterbury, Matthew Innocent. Uh, an ordained clergyman who was badly abused um, and and complained about it and asked for help and got no help uh, and was cold shouldered by an institution that took forever as it is still taking forever to deal with complaints of victims uh, accused the archbishops of Canterbury and York of being less than Christian being less than competent in in fulsome language that he was entitled to use um, the Archbishop of York, when it was put to him by the legal counsel that uh, procedures he had been involved with had been handled really quite badly and that the church was culpable in terms of the way it reacted, agreed. He said, that's the case. And then she said to him, and you, what about your actions and your competence? And he said, I've done nothing wrong. <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> it sat so badly with the facts as we knew them and, well, I'll just leave the response to speak for itself. The Archbishop of Canterbury was also asked, he's a bit cannier than Sentamu, um, and a little bit more politically aware or perhaps better politically trained by his advisers. 
but he was being asked about an episode where he had behaved with a, a deeply unpleasant and unsympathetic uh, response to a man who claimed to be victimized by one of Welby's colleagues when Welby was dean at Liverpool. Um, Welby said, you, he used the, the, the classical phrase, well, I, I'm sure, you know, I, I could do better next time. Lessons will be learned. Uh, it wasn't as good as it should have been. Now, the reason why I'm starting off with this is partly because it was in the public domain this, this week, but also because I was phoned up by somebody who's been listening to our show and uh, has been following what Matthew Innocent has been saying, because he himself was a victim of Smythe and has had a very bad time as a result. And indeed, if I had any doubts about the damage to, um, to someone's capacity for managing uh, talking to this man, I'd, I'd like to think of him as a friend. I, we, we we had a, a a trusting talk together, and I felt very deeply for what he must have been through, both at the hands of Smythe, but as bad. It's not for me to say if it's bad or worse at the hands of the church. And one of the things that he that he wanted to say was that that Welby hasn't been telling the truth. Um, at least he's not been telling the full truth. I mean, of course. Uh, it's not difficult to pick ways of using words and phrases that are not outright lies, but fall sufficiently f short of the real truth as to be almost that. And one of the things he said was that during, when he was asked about his own involvement in the UN camps uh, and the extent to which he was part of this culture, uh, he, he demoted himself and described himself as a mere dormitory officer, someone who went around at night time making sure everyone was tucked up in bed. But my my uh, my friend said, there's no such thing. This was an invention of Welby. You either, you had those who were responsible for running the camps, they were called officers, modeled on the military model, and those who weren't, and Welby was and did. And his attempt to reconfigure uh, the responsibilities later on was symptomatic of an attempt to improperly distance himself from the whole thing. And one of the things he said was that Welby knew about the Smythe issue for some time and did nothing about it. When he was pressed in one particular frank interview as to why he didn't, he said that he thought that the diocese was dealing with it. Well, this is a matter of such importance, such power, such danger, that if you have responsibility, as Welby does in an institution, you can't get away with saying that. Well, except that he has got away with saying it. And uh, I was being reminded that this was simply uh, so short of the truth as to be wholly inadequate. The difficulty also is, how much did he know about Fletcher? And the answer is uh, something, but not enough clearly for him to do anything about it. And what we have, again, is two serious moral failings, uh, abuse at the very hot top of the church, with people whose responsibility it is as part of their office to act swiftly and properly, failing to act, and then failing to own up for acting. And the problem with failing to own up for acting is that, is that you then uh, you, you displace the problem elsewhere. You make other people carry the can for it and the institution doesn't learn the lessons. And one of the things we've been hearing from the victims time and time and time and time again is that the institution of the Church of England, however much it throws money at it, reorganizes safeguarding, attempts to spin its own reputation in the public. It hasn't learned the lessons. It has neither held people to account properly nor has it looked after the people who were damaged by them. There's, there's also a cultural blindness, and whether it's, whether it's cultural, whether it's, whatever it is, is a blindness. Uh, one of our uh, colleagues uh, sent to us a sermon tape made by a man named Mark Rustin. And Mark Rustin is one of the pre previous generation's evangelical leaders based at Cambridge. Great St. Uh, Andrews? Great St. Andrews. One of these major, uh, major evangelical flagship parishes, and he was the one that was sort of called in to sort of clean up in the first Smythe uh, scandal in the early '80s. In other words, he had knowledge of what he was doing, and it was all part of the attempt to get Smythe out of the country, get this thing over and done with. Well, this man gave a sermon that was sent to me uh, recently. I listened to the audio, and he talks about Christian suffering. And towards the end of the sermon, uh, he talks about some uh, young uh, students, young men, who voluntarily submitted them to savage beatings 
in the understanding that this suffering would make them closer to Christ. This is a man who oversaw the review internally of the Smythe sadomasochistically beating young boys. And after the fact, in a sermon at his church, he talks about these boys having voluntarily submitted, that they were as responsible for the crimes of Smythe and others as the perpetrators themselves. So the attitude is blame the victim have n and take no knowledge or cognizance whatsoever of power structures, of maturity, of Christian ordained leadership or lay leadership versus young, impressionable young men. That's this is the man who led the inquiry and, he's, and he, after, years later, in a sermon on suffering, is still blaming the victims. And George, one of the elements you've, you've missed out, which you need to add on to that, is you know who his most famous tenant was, who stayed with him and was a house guest in his house. It was Justin. Justin Welby stayed with Mark Ruston. That's where he lived when he was in Cambridge. I lost you, Gavin. Hey, okay. I, I still have Gavin here. Did you repeat that? You have a... Yes, I, I was saying that what you might have added to your, to your perfectly proper uh, analysis what you might have added to your perfectly proper analysis of Mark Ruston's sermon was you might have told people who Mark Ruston's most famous tenant was, whom he shared his vicarage with. The answer was it was Justin Welby. That was where Justin Welby lived when he was in Cambridge. It is inconceivable that around the table, uh, if particularly if Ruston is preaching this in church, that Justin Welby was not exposed to a fairly significant part of the narrative, even if he didn't know it already. Now, the, uh, what were his initials, E.P. or P.E. Nash? Uh, I Bash. Do you mean Bash? Bash, Bash yeah. Nash, who, found, who started no. these camps that were called Bash camps. Uh, and when he died, I believe it was in 82 or 83, Welby, who had finished university, was working in Paris, came back to All Souls Langham Place to London to be part of the memorial funeral service. Now, if all Justin Welby was was a was a, uh, a, a senior boy who made sure everybody was tucked up in bed and had the lights turned out. For him to, to moving from Paris to London is not as easy uh, as you can imagine. It costs money, it costs time. For him to be part of the funeral group, part of that uh, group of people, it was important and necessary for him to be there. And this is the environment and the culture and the setting in which this abuse took place. What does it tell us about what Welby knew? Well, and also my my my, my we'll call it my correspondent for the moment. It's a telephone call, but it's a it's a dignified nomenclature. My, my correspondent pointed out that um, the Welby was involved with the UN camps for three decades: the seventies, the eighties, and the nineties. So I think it raises a presumption of some element of understanding of what was going on, both on the surface and under the surface. Uh, and certainly we, we know that, that um, before Channel 14, ch before Channel 4 got hold of this and broke it in 2017, uh, Welby knew about the Smythe disappearance uh, for, that, for that period of time and, and took no action himself. Now, he might want to explain why he took no action, but what we have is a situation where he clearly knew much of what was going on, took no action, and hasn't taken any accountability since. And part of why am I so exercised about these sins of the past of sort of awful, horrific, but localized abuse issues? Uh, what has it got to do with me? Well, part of it is, is that the people who were part of this culture have been promoting each other into positions of responsibility and authority, and it looks like they're covering for each other. Jonathan Fletcher is a wealthy, independently wealthy man, and he set up a private trust, the FC Trust, whose accounts are held with the charity commissioners. And looking at the most recent uh, returns filed with the charity commissioners, I believe it was April 2018, it shows who Fletcher gave money to. Well, hold on. We're not being very honest here. He's not just wealthy. He's government official wealthy. True. He's, uh, <laughs> I mean, he's, he's got lots of money. Fletcher set up this trust, and he's just been distributing it. And everyone, not all but one of the 
in May and April 2019, letters were sent out by four evangelical leaders, uh, Rod Thomas, Vaughn Roberts, Robin Weeks, and William Taylor, all saying, be careful of this man. There's great problems. Don't allow him to preach. He's lost his license to officiate. Well, all of those people, save for Rod Thomas, were on the receiving end of Fletcher's financial address through the institutions they were running up through that time. Now, money talks, follow the money, and we see money flowing from Fletcher to these institutions. We see jobs flowing through Fletcher to these people to give them the positions that they now hold. There is a Freemasonry of sorts. I'm not saying real Freemasonry, small f, but a cultic activity of initiates who went through these things that have warped a section of the Christian church. And that's, I think, the exercise. Of, and it's the cover up, the ongoing cover up and denials and uh, hypocrisy that just so upsets me. And, and another difficulty, and, and here I'm stuck between either uh, using innuendo or making accusations without people being able to deny them, which is a difficult position to be in. Uh, the alternative is to say nothing. One of the things we know from the reports about Smythe is that, is that some of the people you've mentioned, George, are named as victims of Smythe. In other words, they were, not, they, they were both victims of Smythe and contemporaries of, or, or, uh, or companions of Fletcher. So again, there is a, a presumption, particularly if they experienced Smythe's beating, that they knew exactly what was going on. Uh, and it's very difficult to believe that they didn't know what Jonathan Fletcher was doing uh, to what appears to be a very large number of people. And as yet, we haven't found anyone, well, well we, you found one person, as, as we know from a previous episode, but, but an enormous pressure has been placed on people not to tell the truth about what happened and by not telling the truth, there's no, there's no real possibility to, to continue. I have to say, I continue, I, I feel very sorry that, that our, our friend and colleague Andy Lyons has caught up in this. But, but given the fact that we know that, pre that Fletcher has put a great deal of pressure on people, described in some circles as blackmail, it, it does make it problematic that, that Bishop Lyons' own statement doesn't even name Fletcher. It could be somebody else. Yeah. George, let's uh, close out here and talk about the call for victims. Uh, you posted a, a letter on Anglican.inc. And what's that about? We are working, we collectively are working with a number of clergy who have had victims come to them seeking counsel, clergy in England. I have been contacted by people, Gavin has been contacted by people, and we're hearing bits and pieces of a larger story. I have, I have been contacted by the secular press, there are several newspapers working on this story. And at this point, we need somebody to go first. Somebody to say, I, John, uh, John, John Doe, this was done to me on this date and in this place and in this time. And mm -hmm. to bring this into the public area, because all at this stage we can do is tap around things because we can't violate the, these people have been victimized and I'm not going to do it again by pushing them out in front of the public light. Well, let, let's, I, we're just hoping that somebody will go forward, public come life. forward. And now we're Anglican unscripted Anglican Inc. We, we're not a commercial venture. We don't need to be first. We have no mm -hmm. desire to be first. We are perfectly happy and willing, and I hope that the broad street, broadsheets, the big papers, run with this story and make a big stink with this, because then we can go into the great details and depths that you don't get in a 500-word article. But we need somebody to, to, to speak up. And well, we also uh, hold, hold need to reach out to the victims, because... Uh, the church has failed them so far. We've talked to a lot of victims. They just won't go public. Correct. We, and we need we're not so, we, going to victimize them a second time by no, telling their stories without no, the it, we, we need people to finally go public. And, and I but, know it, it's hard. It, you can't. Here's the thing. I mean, mm. what are the lessons of the Catholic Church in the United States abuse scandal? These victims cannot get help until the church is held accountable, until the church, you know, the, 
we know of one victim. Uh, we know we have been told of one victim who finally the church offered what Gavin, what Gavin was it three half hour sessions to get over uh, abuse. Three three sessions of 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 of, of psychotherapy without any uh, analysis, without any sense of where it was going. Uh, I mean, the the it, it's so superficial, so so ludicrous professionally, so irresponsible that that. that it, it, we words words fail one. This okay. This was a while ago, but nonetheless, if if you're the person who's, um, you know, like Matthew Innocent, it wasn't Matthew Innocent, but if you're the person who's been dealing with this for some time, the fact that it was five years ago before the church learned a little bit more about counselling doesn't help you in the slightest. It just means you've been strung out all all a lot longer. But the 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 example and the experience of the American perspective of the Catholic abuse scandals has shown that the church, the institution, could not be trusted to do the right thing until it, the light was shown upon it. And then, and only then, was the money freed up to pay for the counseling and to compensate those people who were damaged. And this is something that we're, we are having to deal with damaged people that the Church of England should take responsibility for and has so far refused to take adequate action. Gentlemen, we've gone beyond 20 minutes, beyond 25, beyond 30, beyond 35 minutes. We've gone a long time today. We appreciate uh, you guys sticking with us through this whole episode. Uh, we went long because we couldn't record on Monday. Uh, what's our schedule next week? Gavin, yeah, you traveling again? You going to the no, Vatican I'm or something? Pleased. I'm... I'm... <laughs> I'm pleased to say I'm fully available. Okay, and, and George, you're not going nowhere. Well, Kevin, can we do my big breaking story in Indian corruption? Will that? No, will no, that sorry, no, no, no. I'm not increasing the Indian audience for Anglican and scripted. They're there already. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashton, and you've been listening to episode 520 of Anglican Unscripted on the 19th of July 2019.